This is PBS. I'm Charles Percy. Almost 50 years ago, Winston Churchill saw Europe shattered by World War II. He declared that if the continent was to be saved from infinite misery and final doom, his fellow Europeans would have to build a kind of United States of Europe. In our series, The New Europeans, that you have been watching here on PBS, we have seen Europe taking concrete steps to answer Churchill's call for union. At the end of this year, the 12 nations of the European community will unite their vast energies in a single market of 350 million people. A truly united Europe could be the most potent economic and political force on Earth. But at the same time, the age-old ideal of European unity could remain just that, an ideal, frustrated as ever by old rivalries, nationalism, and ethnic hatreds of almost medieval brutality. The European Community's blueprint for political and economic union, the Maastricht Treaty, is as of now bogged down in national controversies. Americans have much at stake in Europe's future, and here with me to help sort all of this out are Madeleine Albright, President of the Center for National Policy and a former official at the National Security Council, Andreas van Ock the European Community's ambassador to the United States and former Prime Minister of the Netherlands. George Vest, former Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and U.S. Ambassador to the European Community. And Martin Walker, U.S. Bureau Chief for the respected British newspaper, The Guardian. Ambassador Van Ock, the Maastricht Treaty is in deep trouble. Please review with us briefly the aims and, perp and status of the Maastricht Treaty and how it relates to the EC's single market program for 1992. Andreas? Yeah. The, the Maastricht Treaty has essentially a double focus. On the one hand, uh, it aims to uh, develop an ever closer uh, cooperation between the EC governments on political and security matters so as to give Europe over time a political profile, a political entity. And on the other hand, the other main component, the treaty um, aims at establishing an economic and monetary union, that is a single currency, a European central bank, um, by the end of this decade. That is what the treaty is all about. Now, the state of play at the moment is that we have um, to have 12 ratifications in all the countries concerned and we are uh, encountering serious problems in at least two of them in Britain and, and in Denmark. Nonetheless it's my sincere conviction and not just a professional talk that we will have the 12 ratifications albeit with some delay that means some time in 1993. Well, I think that uh, in watching it as an American observer that everyone wants very much to see this happen and I think that people were somewhat surprised that this process that looked as though it was moving forward all of a sudden got derailed and I think that many uh, Americans would be interested in knowing what were the things that made it so difficult. Was it all of a sudden that there, these people that in effect were still very nationalist minded were being asked to integrate beyond what they were ready to do? Was Maastricht something that the leaders wanted to do and that the people weren't ready for? Or what is the problem? Why is this having so much trouble? I think we have to realize the degree to which the goalposts were moved in the course of this game. When we first started talking in Europe about Europe 92, it was clear that the Europe we were considering was Western Europe. Geographical, ca geographical capital was Brussels. Strategi strategic direction, I think, was across the Atlantic. 
whereas suddenly with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, we have now got a Europe whose real capital is Bonn, Berlin, whose strategic center is really Middle Europa, Central Europe, and I think whose strategic direction is becoming the half colony, half problem to the east. The but Martin, would you, would you be good enough to take us through the domestic political problems that were just mentioned by the ambassador? The turmoil we see surrounding, say, the the uh, uh, British government in deep trouble over Maastricht, the French farmers taking to the streets and demonstrating uh, uh, the, for the cuts in the uh, farm subsidies, German warnings about a state of emergency over the refugee crisis. Uh, those are the things that, uh, what, do we, what happens to the uh, monetary system? How do we get Maastricht back on track with individual European governments in such turmoil? Well, I, I think Americans might be pretty sympathetic to the, to the realization that individual states can have political difficulties which really may have nothing to do with the problems of Washington, but which somehow exacerbate the general feeling of public alienation. The one common factor of all of those individual national crises that you've mentioned, the problems of John Major in Britain, the problems of, uh, of, of reunification in Germany, the problems of the very tired regime of President Mitterrand in France, or the, the, the problems of the Socialist Party's uh, um, corruption scandal in Italy, the one thing in common with all of this is recession. When this new idea of hopeful Europe em emerged in the late 80s, we were going through the 1980s boom. By the time it began to become reality, we were going through the 1990s recession. And I think that has had a great deal to do with it. But my, I think my, my conclusion in all this would be that what Europe is trying to do is what America was doing in the, in the 1780s. We're trying to build some kind of, of, of political unit greater than all of us. But the trouble is, we are doing so without going through the elementary precaution of writing the Federalist Papers. We haven't had that debate that John Jay and Hamilton and Madison had with you. George, you want to come in? I, I just couldn't agree with more with what you're saying because we took 13 years to go through a confederal period before we moved into the final moment for a constitution. We had the Federalist Papers and there was a large education process that went on within the colonies. There hasn't been that education process. I mean, I think that to some extent, I agree with you on what I call the indigenous problems in each separate country, but we had a, I got the impression from my European friends that to a considerable extent, it wasn't adequately explained and advertised, and they felt they were being offered a, what we call a pig in a poke. Did it seem to you that the political leaders were somewhat out of touch with the, the average European, the average person, without being sensitive to the impact that they, this is all going to have on, on their lives? Uh, somewhat, yes, because you have had a period in which the community, through the commission, is now beginning to impact and cut into daily people's daily lives. Now things are being made done by commission regulations, put into effect in, no, in national laws. For the first time, people across the Western European countries are beginning to find that there's another entity that controls what they can and cannot do. That's a little hard for people to take, young to get used to. And it's very significant how much it is happening. To, to carry your simile a little bit further, what you have happening in Europe is uh, Europe suddenly at Maastricht tried to move beyond the Articles of Confederation, but it had w already put into effect the Supreme Court mm -hmm. because the European Court at Luxembourg is already ruling on all kinds of activities that affect daily life and national freedom of action. So Europe is in a, in a mixed way. It's got a Supreme Court it hasn't yet moved beyond the loosest kind of confederation. Andreas, as a former uh, prime minister, you certainly uh, could comment on that particular aspect. Uh, did you feel that they were out of touch with the average person uh, on their concerns? I think so. In hindsight, yes. Uh, I have been one of th those uh, culprits, short-sighted culprits, who participated in decision-making in uh, closed uh, boardrooms, and we never had a problem. 
the, uh, the public at large, the electorates at large, uh, accepted it all without any comment, and it all went well. And so it was an unhappy surprise last December, or shortly after December, that the electorate sort, sort of erupted and, and exploded. And now all kinds of myth and scares and lunacies are going around, such as you, you may have seen it, Douglas Hurt, one of these days, published a memo to reassure the British and indirectly others that, for example, the tale that, uh, uh, that European fishermen in the future would have to wear hair nets or would have to have condoms on, on board their, their, their fisher boats or that the British fire, firemen in, in the future would have to replace their yellow trousers with uh, blue uh, European uh, uh, overalls. All these are Euro myth, lunacies and scares. But it is typical of the situation we are in that many people think that kind of things is coming over them. But some, some pretty crazy Bad things have, have come over us. I mean, some of the favorite cheeses I enjoyed as a boy or any other European enjoyed as a boy, they have gone. The Germans, who have one of the finest beers in the world, suddenly told that their centuries-old cleanliness law on beer means nothing. They're going to have to take French chemical-laden beer or English beer and so on. And there's been a simple lack of sensitivity to the old particulars traditions of a very of a very tradition rich society of Europe which I think has been foolish and at the same time it hasn't been replaced by any great inspirational idea any attempt to sell the great adventure of Europe to the voters Madeline I, I would like to hear your comments but also I'd like to have you put it in the context that I presume you believe with me that through the centuries political friendships have tended to follow the trade lanes. What is going to happen now uh, when the world trading system seems to be hanging in balance uh, because of the bickering between the United States and the French over, over agricultural subsidies? And, and uh, will the wars of the centuries in Europe be replaced by trade wars involving the economic community, involving the United States, involving Japan? Uh, is this going to be a problem? Or could you comment on that? Well, I think that it is going to be a problem, but what we have to do is try to avoid it and try to work to uh, not have it be a problem in the long run. I think the reason, though, that it's a problem is that those of us that look at the international system know that it is completely out of kilter. I think the basic kinds of institutions that we've had are not functioning properly. People don't know. Martin's talking about the big idea. People don't know who the enemy is. They don't know who their friends are. And also, because we are very much uh, in a period where domestic and foreign policy are totally intertwined, trade is one of those issues that is so uh, really neuralgic in terms of domestic policy. So all of a sudden, you have people that have not been consulted being made part of a larger system. And so the only way they can react is by saying, we want it our way. We don't want to be part of a larger global system. And I think just to disagree with you in, con in comparing it to the United States, you were talking about the rich traditions. People came to the United States from someplace, mm -hmm. settled in an empty land, er, pretty empty, and then basically <laughs> tried to be Americans. What you have are very strong nationalist tendencies, even exacerbated now by uh, increasing democracy, so that you are trying to create an all-European system at a time when people are feeling much greater self-identity than ever before and are taking this out on the political system. Mm -hmm. But to your point, basically, we have to get to a global economy, and the question is how the publics can be persuaded to have this larger view and not care so much about their beef or their cheese or their wine. Working in the walking in the shoes of the average uh, person in Europe, uh, here you have uh, three factors uh, community, regionalism, nationalism. Uh, which will prevail, do you think? Uh, and what are your views? Well, let's first of, first of all ma make the point that uh, nationalism, in its worst form, is uh, shaping up, of, of has already shown its ugly head in Eastern Europe in the Balkans in particular, and now it's uh, starting in the form of Soviet republics and not so much in, um, in Western Europe, or not at all in Western Europe in, in the same sense. Um, the, uh, having said that, it is a, it's a fact of life that in, in the 
the community um, of the EC12, there is uh, an upsurge, certain upsurge of, of nationalist feelings at the moment. That is certainly correct. Um, at the same time, the, the community has, um, has had the merit, and still is having the merit, of uh, keeping nationalist uh, sentiments that could run out of control in check, such as one example only. I, uh, I dare say that we would perhaps no longer have a Belgium without the European community. The, 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 the life, the, the history long, uh, of one, at least one century long clash between the Wallons and, and the Flemish uh, has been become rather irrelevant thanks to their being be belonging to the European community. So the matter has different aspects. If there, if there is a long-term hope for a resolution of the problems in Northern Ireland, I think that will take place as well within the context of, yeah. of, a, of a European state, because then you will have a much, a much lesser problem of national sovereignty between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. Right. Uh, just one point. You use the term nationalism and then you use the term community. It seems to me in its simplicity we're in for a long period of nationalism of one kind or another as a base, as the building bricks in what, we're bu what you're building in Europe. But it seems to me to meet with your own interests, to take care of your own interests, the only answer for much of you is community because mm -hmm. you have no other way of dealing with your problems. There, there, there is a third, a third layer that's important here. We've got this supranational level of the community. We've got the old nation-state level. But as Madeleine was pointing out, one of the most vibrant and one of the most exciting phenomena of the last 20 years has been the, the rebirth of a kind of a regional patriotism. We saw it, I think, particularly with the Olympic Games, where we saw that this Catalonian region yeah, yeah. of Spain mm -hmm. had yeah. a particular kind of vibrancy of its own. We see it in France with Brittany. I think we're seeing it also to a degree in the British Isles, with Scotland and with, with, with Ireland, and as you were pointing out, in Belgium as well, between the, between the communities there. And that is... I think you also see it in Germany with Bavaria and Northern Italy, Italy, Southern Italy. Absolutely. But don't you also think that some of the ethnic conflicts in Eastern Europe, which you describe as being so different as Western Europe, have in fact infected some of the Western European concepts? Because all of a sudden, some of the groups are becoming more and more uh, conscious of their own identity. If, for instance, uh, Subcarpathian Ruthenians think that they should be recognized. Does that not give impetus to some of the uh, groups in Western Europe to have even greater recognition? And I think what we need to look at are new concepts that this, the nation state does not exist. And we do not yet have this larger entity. And we are more and more concerned about cultural autonomy and cultural respect. I was very interested in the previous programs that I think explained uh, the Catalonians or the Basques or uh, any number of various groups who want to be respected for uh, who they are ethnically. And we have to learn how to do that within a larger community aspect that uh, George has been talking about. One of, the, one of the interesting factors on this is, is that one of the ways you define a nation state is that it is a taxation authority. And I think one of the really <laughs> striking things about Maastricht is the way that it which it enshrines the right of the community itself to be a taxing authority and also levels out an awful lot of the tax structures, particularly the VAT, the value-added tax, between the individual countries. In other words, the rights to tax are being taken steadily away from the nation states and being given to this rather greater body and also to some of these smaller regional ones as well. And that, I think, is the key to that puzzle. George, you when mentioned uh, a resurgent natural nationalism, and I w would appreciate your pointing out how this applies to the boiling over that's gone in in Yugoslavia. Uh, we've seen uh, Eastern European uh, countries that have spawned a refugee crisis that has really beset Europe, and Germany in particular has caused all kinds of problems there. Uh, how will this affect the, uh, the uh, how will this uh, uh, complicate more the plans for a united Europe? You use the right word, complicate, uh, because it works, has two kinds of consequences. Uh, each country has a slightly different kind of interplay of migration, of external pressures because of the change, uh, changing composition of the people who want to take refuge there and so on. 
Therefore, there is this pressure of, this is mine. So a country says, this is my problem. I have to deal with it. But in a Europe where people can flow relatively easily across boundaries from one country to the next, with the exception of England, uh, I think the countries are going to be pushed much more than they have done so far, pushed into, if not the formality of it, which might have flown from Maastricht, to a much greater degree of informal cooperation, because it is going to be a problem that flows right across Europe, does not stay inside national boundaries. But George, don't you think that, in effect, the flow has aggravated prejudice? In a uh, no uh, project that I was involved no. in where we did a survey of all of Europe, we found that at least 30% of the people in every country had an unfavorable view of their major minority. And then when you put in all kinds of other people of mm -hmm. various backgrounds, it just exacerbates this. So I think it's more than complicating. I think it's fairly dangerous and something that we do need to all be concerned about because the intermingling is not being helpful at the moment, but creating major divisions between rich and poor, between North and South Europe, East and West Europe. And rather than seeing this unity, I think we're at a very kind of sensitive and tense moment in terms of the intermingling. And this intermingling has very little to do with the Maastricht process. It has mm -hmm. everything to do, I think, with recession, with the end of the mm -hmm. Cold War, exactly. and, with, and with economic problems in North Africa. And so Martin, could I uh, take you back to what we saw in our series, The uh, New European? Uh, we saw an interesting segment that, uh, uh, over the controversy surrounding Euro Disney. Who would ever think there'd be controversy <laughs> over, over Disney? But many Europeans fear that the single market uh, will lead to a dilution of Europe's uh, unique cultural uh, heritage. Are these fears justified, do you believe? I think it's about time we, uh, we were fairly honest about what Europe's cultural heritage really is. We can talk about it being the, the source of the novel or the symphony or the opera, but I mean, Europe is also, also the society that brought you genocide in the concentration camp. Of all the world's great tribes, the Europeans are by far the most warlike, the most ruthless, the most aggressive, the most greedy. History, I think, establishes this quite clearly. The, the reason why we have had peace over the last 40 years is quite simply that with American troops on one side, Russians on the other, Euro the European tribes have had some adult supervision. And now that that adult supervision is in danger of being withdrawn, we're going back to our to our old unpleasant ways again. That is the danger. Beyond that, of course, we, uh, we, we've always known that, that part of the price for being quite so politically tumultuous in Europe, whether you look at Renaissance Italy or at, at, Shakespeare's, at Shakespeare's England, has, uh, has been that you get an extraordinary cultural creativity and flowering out of this. But I think that the kind of things that we hear, the kind of complaints about a cultural Chernobyl out of a McDonald's stand or uh, out of Disneyland really are uh, we are gilding the lily rather too much. <laughs> May I add you some, something? If, yes, if you of course. That is, uh, I, I, I'm ready to be, to be self-critical, and so I, in, in a way I enjoyed the, the latest intervention by Martin, but I think he, he, he is overdoing it quite a bit, quite a bit. Uh, the sheer fact of France and Germany, who have been arch enemies for a century at most, who have been three times at war within one century. And two of these wars have evolved into world wars, the United States getting involved. They are now the closest allies one could think of. They even have started uh, forming a Euro core, a, 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 the, the, the nucleus of a Franco-German army. Now, it is not very impressive yet, but that is not the point. The point is, who could ever conceive, say, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, that the French and the Germans together would start setting up a Euro army. That is not too bad. Andreas, uh, what is the future of European security and what role should the United States play in it? Now, I, um, I really do feel there is uh, no real reliable European security without uh, close involvement by the United States. Um, so I'm, I'm, I firmly do believe that as much as we uh, may develop over the years to come something like uh, a European defense identity, it should be uh, incorporated 
into NATO. It should be uh, the, famous, uh, the famous European pillar of the NATO structure that we have envisaged already decades ago. Without America, there, there, there would be a, a reason for a lot of concern. Reference be made to Martin Walker. <laughs> We regretfully have to bring this panel to a close. We've run out of time, but I thank each one of you for all of your wonderful participation. Thank you very much, Ambassador Van Ock. George Zest, we thank you very much indeed. And Martin, we thank you. And Madeline, we thank you very, very much indeed. Madeline Albright. We have seen how much is at stake in Europe's future. There's a long road ahead, and we'll all be watching the headlines for what happens next. I'm Charles Percy. Thanks for joining us.